My play of the day for round 10 of the Vicance tournament is the game between Ivan Sokolov with the white pieces against Peter Leko. Now, so, so far in the tournament, of his nine games, Peter Leko has drawn seven. He has a very, very solid reputation and he has a very cautious style. But today showed that when pushed, he can be provoked into playing like a tiger. So let's see what happens. Okay, d4 from Sokolov, that's usually what he plays. And the game was a Nimzo Indian, that's bishop b4, denotes the Nimzo Indian defence for black. And Sokolov played his favourite Rubenstein system. You might recall that he played this in an earlier round against Pantala Hari Krishna. And this is the main line of the Rubenstein variation. And here, well, there are many ways to play the position. Uh, you can play knight c6, you can take on c4 and play bishop d7, as Anand did <coughs> against Gelfrand in their World Championship match earlier in the year. But Leko played, you could say, the main line. He exchanged off all the pawns, and he's given white this isolated queen's pawn. Okay, so this is a very standard position, and... Yeah, it's really the starting point of theory in, in the, the, the main line of this Rubenstein variation. And Leko played b6. And this is, well, it's been played by many players, but you could say this is the Karpov system. It's how Anatoly Karpov liked to play in, in, the, in the 1970s. He started playing like this. So bishop g5 looks like a very logical move, pinning the knight. So bishop b7, and now rook c1. Okay, all this was played instantly by the players. Uh, rook c1 is the most popular move in this position. There are, there are many other moves. And now, if you remember if a couple of rounds ago, Hare Krishna played knight c6 here and achieved a reasonable position after this. Bishop dropped back to, to break the pin. And... Well, this is rather rather typical uh, isolated queen pawn strategy, and he managed to exchange the queens, and well, the game after some exchanges eventually ended in a draw. But well, another another way of playing the position for black is to play knight d7. This is really how Karpov used to play. So the knight protects this knight here obviously prepares rook c8 and very often the queen comes out to c7 as well okay, it's just just another way of playing the position okay so h6 from leko and now knight c6 so it's exactly the same as the Hare Krishna game with the inclusion of these moves now this can be rather risky for white uh, for black excuse me if white manages to build up an attack on this diagonal, you can see that the g6 square has been slightly weakened. And clearly that's what Sokolov is going for here. Leko played bishop e7. Now I think you, you must play this move to break the pin. It's an important move. Now bishop b1. So white's aim is very, very clear to build up here and... Well, you're not going to get a direct mate, but you know, even to force g6, and then these pawns look rather sensitive. Rook c8 from Leko. Okay, this is all solid stuff. Very sensible move. Now, the point is that if white tries queen d3 straight away, black actually doesn't need to play g6. You can knock the queen away off the diagonal with knight b4, and queen d3 is clearly a wasted move. So, rook e1 from Sokolov. Okay, this is quite typical for these isolated queen pawn positions. You put the rook on e1, and well, very often this rook is very usefully placed on the e-file. Sometimes you can break with d5. Sometimes, as we'll see, you can even sacrifice on e6. But rook e1 is a standard move. And now, well, I, I suspect that Leko had prepared this manoeuvre in advance. He played knight h5. Now this particular manoeuvre was made famous 
by Anatoly Karpov when he used it against Viktor Korchnoi in their World Championship match in 19, uh, 1981. And Karpov won a, a really a model game in this line. Now the idea is that, I mean it wasn't exactly the same position as this I should say in the Korchnoi Karpov game, but it was a similar isolated queen pawn position. Now the idea is that after bishop takes bishop, knight takes, well it's good for black to exchange off that dark squared bishop, it makes life much easier for the defence, you know you, you might be able to play your queen to this square without fear of being hassled by the dark squared bishop. Also this knight can sometimes hop into f4, so for example here that already looks quite attractive for black and you're using this bishop very well indeed. But also after this exchange with the knight coming back to e7 you'll see that <coughs> black has far greater control over the d5 square. So you're starting to gain control over the position. Okay, I, I mean I think bishop takes would be a solid move for white. Um, I mean you can, this is still playable for white, you know maybe you could exchange bishops here but with each exchange, white's attacking chances on the king side decrease, and that suits black for playing against the isolated queen pawn. Okay, Sokolov knows all this and was trying to attack. He played queen c2, threatening a checkmate on h7. Okay, so g6 prevents that and seems like everything's okay. Oh yes, I should mention, if the bishop drops back to g3, then of course black will bag the two bishops and play the bishop to f6 and it should be absolutely fine. Okay, Sokolov wants to attack. He played rook takes e6. Now if this rook is taken, it's checkmate. For example, and bishop g6 ends things. But Leko of course had foreseen rook takes e6, a very obvious move, and he played well I beg your pardon, he didn't play that, he played knight f4. Covering g6, so rook takes g6 check is no longer possible, and attacking the rook, and there are still these threats to the bishop on h4, so for example if the rook comes back to e4 then we can play knight b4, attacking the queen and hitting the rook and well all the threats stand there. basically it's working out for black it, it uh, wins material and what else well what about let me just get rid of the paint from the board what about bishop takes bishop well then knight takes the rook is still attacked but also now this diagonal is open so after this we can exchange and play knight f5 now black just for the moment is still a pawn down but you can see White's king side has been shattered. These knights are fantastic in place, and there's already a very nasty threat of queen g5. Basically, black has a huge position there. Okay, let's go back. So suddenly, Sokolov was forced to actually ditch some material. Now he played rook takes e7, which looks very dangerous because white gets rid of the dark squared bishop. But actually, black's defensive resources are, well, more than adequate. Queen d2 played, attacking the knight. Now black has to play g5, which again, looks it looks rather risky, because it's sort of opening up black's king position. But, well, white can't do anything here. You know, there's still threats to take here. Sokolov tried knight e5, so that prevents any, well, just removes the knight from this threat of bishop takes knight. And of course if pawn takes then queen takes knight and, well, white's the only the exchange down and has very good compensation. It still looks rather scary for black. You know, his king is open, two bishops, this diagonal is open. But Leko now thought for a total of 37 minutes over his reply. Now, he is a brilliant calculator. You, you think, you know, he seems like a very defensive player. But often good defensive players are brilliant calculators. He recognises the danger. 
Now he found knight eg6, which I think is a very practical move indeed. It blocks out the bishop, it plugs the king side, it opens up the line for the queen to maybe join the defence. I think an excellent practical move. Let me just show you another variation. There's, there's more than one good move here for, for black. Knight ed5. Now if the bishop retreats, then black exchanges on c3. There's a really nice tactic here. And now queen takes d4. Wins for black. If queen takes, then we fork king and queen and we recapture and there's a pin. So black is just going the exchange up there. And if pawn takes, then we exchange rooks and again White has walked into a fork. So knight, knight ed, of course white doesn't have to play exactly like that, but it seems to me that knight ed5 is also a strong move. But Leko's move, excellent move, very practical, plugging the king side. And he'd also calculated very deeply here. After the exchange of knights, he's opened up the f-file. So he's starting to attack now. The game is, is really turning around and simply knight takes g2 and white's king, as we'll soon see, is in big trouble. So black's the exchange up and actually he's looking pretty well coordinated, you know, this, this queen can, can join in the attack sooner or later. If bishop takes g6, just knight f4, it's a very handy move indeed, and queen f6 and black is looking very, very strong. Sokolov tried queen c2, Again, threatening a mate on g6, but queen f6 defends. Bishop b5 looks a bit scary, but Leko had it all under control. a3, now be careful. Suddenly, bishop a2 is a possibility, and black's king looks like it's getting cut to shreds. Leko had it all worked out. He played knight h4. Now clearly there's a threat to play knight f3. There's also a threat... Mm, probably not actually, because there's... there's yeah, there is a threat to play queen f3, because the king can hide on h7 from bishop a2. So queen f3 is also a threat here. In fact, white has no defence. Sokolov tried bishop a2, but this was taken. A very simple winning move. It's rather important that that knight defends g6, and if knight takes a2, rook takes, and this is a winning move. If the king comes to the diagonal, then, well, everything wins. Knight d4, check, and picks up the rook, and if king f1, here's a really cute move, bishop a6, Check, the king has to come to g2, and again, we finish with a fork. Beautifully calculated by Peter Lecco. Thanks very much for watching.